begin. Greetings to everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm so glad to see you all here today. We have a terrific guest who's talking about an incredibly important subject, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But before we begin, let me just introduce the program. Let me explain how it works, what it's about, what we hope to accomplish, and then we'll start with this week's conversation. And conversation is what the Future Trends Forum is about. If you're new to it, we've been doing this now for a bit more than eight and a half years. Every week we have a conversation about some aspect of the future of higher education, because we believe that an open-ended, organic conversation is the best way to grapple with academia's future. And we say we, I'm Brian Alexander, I'm the forum's creator, and I'm your host. And with me is the excellent Lesnar Radomski, who is here for any of your technical needs. So if you have any issues with audio or video and so on, just ping Lesson, and they'd be glad to help you right away. Now, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions to get a sense of what we've been up to, you can look at our archive. Uh, go to tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive, and you can see more than 400 recordings going back to 2016. And if you'd like to actually go by all those recordings via keywords and topics, just head to the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us, and you can see we've indexed everything by everything from you know, libraries and copyright, open source, presidents, pedagogy, liberal arts, and so on. Now, if you'd like to look ahead to what we're covering, we're scheduling right now into December of this year, and we have a whole series of topics coming up. We have one on decolonizing higher education, more on enrollment. We have a session on how to reform grading. We have a session coming up very fast about what it means to do diversity work right now. We have at least one session on preparing for a potential second Trump administration, another one in the future workforce, and still more. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us, and you can see more there. Now, we can only do this work with the help of generous supporters, and I want to thank them before we proceed. Uh, in New York, NyserNet does great work getting that state's colleges and universities on excellent broadband. And they also do great professional development work. And we're really grateful to them for their work and for their support of us. We're also grateful to Shindig because, as you can see, Shindig makes available the technology we're using now. So if you're new to it or if you've been using other tools for a while, let me just explain how this works. The key thing here is the screen is split into two parts. The top part where I am right now, where the slide is, is called the stage. And we call it that because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on stage. This is where our guest is going to be in just a minute, and this is where you can be too. Now, the second half of the screen is where everybody is. And you can just mouse over all those icons and get a little bit more information about someone. And in fact, if you want to have a private chat with someone, just double click on their icon. And if they're ready and willing to talk to you, your two icons will snap together and you can have your own private conversation. Think of it that you're kind of in an auditorium and I'm up here on stage with these slides and that private chat is you leaning over to whisper into somebody's ear. Now, Unlike a torium, how do you participate in the overall conversation? Well, there are a few ways. Look in the very bottom of the screen. There's a white strip running along with a few different buttons. On one edge, you'll see a number. Right now, it's 32. If you press that number, up pop a couple of boxes. And one of them is a chat box. And this is your typical chat box, which is usually very active during this conversation. People are throwing around all kinds of questions, ideas, footnotes, jokes, job offers, all kinds of stuff. And in fact, if you haven't done so yet, just quickly pop in and say who you are and where you're from. I'll put, I'll do that myself. I'm Brian coming to you from Manassas, Virginia. And I'll keep an eye on the chat box as we go. Now, if you'd also like to uh, position a question for us to consider, just go back to that white strip, find the question mark button. That's a Q&A box. Type in your question. When the time is right, I'll flash it on the screen for everyone to read, and I'll read it out loud so we can all hear it. Now, if your camera is on and your microphone is on, and if you have a beard, no, the beard is optional, just press the raised hand button. And when the time is right, I'll bring you up on stage so you can be face-to-face -face with our guest. So those are the main ways to participate, and we're really grateful to Shindig for making all these ways available. I would also like to thank our supporters on Patreon. And let me just make this bigger here. Uh, Patreon is a place for crowdfunding, uh, some kind of ongoing project. In this case, it's our project of grappling with the future of higher education. People on Patreon contribute as little as a dollar a month to make sure that we pay all our bills and keep the lights on. And these folks here contribute $10 or more a month. People like John Hollenbeck and Laura Armour, uh, Jeannie Kim Han, Matthew Trainum, Kristen Eshelman, Seth Goodman, Fritz Vandover. We're really grateful to them for their support. And you can join them. Just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. Okay, now all of that's an introduction. 
Now I'd like to bring up this week's guest and this week's topic. Now, ever since the forum has begun, we've been exploring in different ways how higher education prepares students for jobs. We've talked about the balance between job preparation and liberal education. We've talked about different impacts of the macroeconomic world. We've talked about different programs, and we're going to keep on doing this. But today's angle is really special and I think very, very rewarding. Uh, ben Woldowski just published a book from Princeton University Press, The Career Arts. You should see a button on your screen, the bottom left, which will lead you to that. It's a very short, portable, very accessible book where he does two things at the same time. He wants to give students of all ages the, a guidebook on how best to get the most out of your co college and university career in order to get the best employment that follows. But it's also, I think, a guide to higher education, to everybody in this world on how best to prepare students for a life of work. Now, how does this work? What are the lessons? What can we practically do? Let me bring up Ben Valdowski just to answer them as the expert for the day. And greetings to you, Ben, in Maryland. How are you today? Hi, Brian, great to see you. I'm very well, thanks. Oh, good, good. I, I haven't seen you since London. I just love saying that. It's true. <laughs> We're such jet setters. I know, I know. That's that's the way things are. Well, well listen, Ben, um, we have a tradition on the forum of, of asking people what they're going to be doing next, because this is, after all, the future transform. I'm curious, what's ahead for you for the next year? What uh, are you going to are you going to follow up with the career arts? Do you have other projects on on uh, on deck? What's going on with you? Well, you know, I, I do. I, I have. Um, it's funny for the for the last several years, after many years of a career with lots of you know large employers in journalism and think tanks at universities, I'm now doing what's called a portfolio career. So that means I have oh, four or five oh. different things. I'm self-employed. I do different things. Um, and my, my biggest project is a new book, which is actually going to be really a, a very directly a follow up to this book, which the working title is The Global Career Arts. You may come up with something mm. different, but it's really looking at mm. what's happening around the world in uh, doing a series of case studies in different countries about what are some of the interesting education to employment uh, reforms and initiatives that are going on and how are they going and what could we learn from them here in the States, you know, where we have a reputation for being a little bit parochial. The idea being not that everyone else is great and we're terrible. You know, we have a lot, a lot of good, good work going on here in higher ed. But I do think that as we try and plot a roadmap for the future here, we would be wise to try and look at what we can learn from some other places. So that's my main project. And then I'll be uh, starting next month. I'll be uh, a, uh, a visiting fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So Yay. Fun, and that'll be a great base for the, the book work. And I hope to do some guest lecturing. So it should be great. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, for, for this new book, have you talked to Alex Usher at all in Canada? <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Alex yeah. is, a, is a, a great authority. And he yeah. is not only he's really he's really a polymath. I mean, he's yeah. he knows everything about Canada, but he knows everything about everything. So <laughs> he's, been, he's been a really useful in telling me about um, some of the interesting global trends. But he's actually really persuaded me that Canada should be one of my case studies in particular because they have some large polytechnics which have been very successful in, in ways that our community colleges have sometimes struggled with trying to meet employer demands in something a little bit less than a traditional degree. So that's yeah. definitely on my list. Oh, I'd be very curious to see, especially, uh, uh, I, actually, I was hearing this in Britain. One of our, one of our previous guests, uh, Donald Clark, was saying that uh, Britain right now is experiencing a terrible financial crunch in their universities. And potentially one reason is they transitioned a whole bunch of uh, polytechnics into universities. Uh, and that seems to have backfired in some interesting ways. Well, I, I, I don't want to get ahead of things too much. Congratulations on the Harvard appointment. And uh, well, here, let me straighten up the screen a little bit so that we uh, we look a little more a little more humane. Um, do you, um, friends, I'm, I'm going to ask Ben a couple of questions about his research and, and, and his arguments here and his recommendations. Um, but as we go, uh, this is all about your questions, and your comments and your thoughts. So as as Ben speaks, think about what you'd like to ask him. Uh, you can tell, uh, although he doesn't have a beard, he's nevertheless very friendly. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll be happy to talk. Um, I, I was struck, Ben, by the by the the, the eight recommendations you give, which I, I think are so concise and so helpful, and should be mounted on a placard uh, at every campus on earth because they are so so handy and so useful. Um, one of them in particular has to do with uh, social networking. 
Uh, you know, the idea that one of the great benefits of post-secondary education, in whichever form you get, whichever form you take it, uh, should be making more and more connections with more and more people. Uh, and this is simply a win. Now, we know that some colleges and universities really foreground this. Um, that's why, you know, that's, the, you know, some of their selling points. Um, but we don't always really make a point of this. In fact, it, it's quite possible for a student to slide through two, three, four, six years of, a, of institution and emerge without that that halo of, of connections. How how can colleges and universities do a better job of that? How can how can we support students in making those kind of crucial career networks? Well, thanks for asking. You've really you've zeroed in on actually a theme that was of all the things I wrote about. A number of the other aspects of the book, you know, the value of college, what we know about alternative credentials, I had been thinking about for a while. The idea of social capital, building networks, was really relatively new to me just in the last few years. Mm. And so it was really kind of fun and refreshing to learn about that. And I'm absolutely convinced there's much more campuses can and should be doing. Some of them are starting, but I would say they're not where they need to be. I mean, the first step is, you know, identifying the fact that this is a this is a challenge and an opportunity. It's a new set of skills that people really by, by often by accidents of birth have yes. different kinds yes. of inherited advantages. So mm -hmm. what that means is, you know, everybody is all of us who, you know, who may have, you know, college degrees and be middle or upper, upper middle class. We have, we know that despite those advantages, our kids still need a lot of coaching and a lot of help learning how to kind of proceed into the workforce, but all the more so, if you are a first generation college student, if you're for a lower income uh, background, and yeah, sure you have a network, but you may not have those connections in the professional world that mm. you're trying to enter. So mm. I think the good news is there is a lot that can be done. You know, I write in the book about a number of nonprofits. One of them is Braven. Um, mm -hmm. I've gotten mm -hmm. to know Ame Eubanks Davis, who's the founder of Braven, who's wonderful, who actually co-hosted a podcast with me at my, my old job at Strata Education Network. And, um, you know, she really works very closely with first generation college students at campuses around the country. And Braven has a coursework component, but it's very much about building a peer group, trying to do, uh, trying to sort of show people. I was up in Newark, New Jersey at, at Rutgers Newark campus. And I, I talked to people there who work with Braven. And, you know, there was a guy, for example, whose you know, family had immigrated from Macedonia when he was a teenager. You know, I think his mom worked as a lab technician at night. His dad was a night security guard. You know, there was no college background. And he was really pleased working with Braven to discover that you could do things like ask somebody for an informational interview, um, go on LinkedIn, you know, beef up your profile. I think one of the things he got some coaching on his own resume, which was 12 pages, and he kind of cut it down to two, which, you know, but look, these are all things you have to learn. You need yeah. coaching. Yeah. So, to, to, there's lots of nonprofits, you know, there's a place called Co-op Career, uh, Careers that does this, you know, there's a lot of groups that are doing this, but I think the college campuses themselves, you know, to go to your question, could really be doing more. You know, there's some uh, that I, I talk about, some little liberal arts colleges like Oberlin College in Ohio or Kenyon College, also in Ohio, where they've really made some efforts to create programs, particularly aimed at first-gen students, to try to give them some ideas about how would you go about networking? How would you go about meeting people? Mm -hmm. And I think that just opening up the topic is really valuable. Bringing in professors who are really trusted sources of advice is extremely useful. One of the things that Kenyon has done is just try to show people how, and of course they're a classic sort of small liberal arts college, but how mm -hmm. some of those things that you do at a little college that may not seem like they're very career focused, nevertheless, a lot of those people go on to interesting jobs. And so they actually have created almost like a map showing where people with various liberal arts colleges at Kenyon have gone on to work. And another example from the other side of the country in California, uh, Point Loma Nazarene, which is a, a religiously affiliated liberal arts college in San Diego, lots of first generation students. They, uh, they the provost actually did an op-ed in Inside Higher Ed a couple a year or two ago, and they moved the career services from I don't know where they were located, but they, he put them under the provost's office. Mm. So that sends mm. a signal that it is part yeah, of your yeah. job as a faculty member. Now, of course, faculty, you know, I think, understandably, they don't, they don't, they're not in the business of job training. They don't want to feel like they're, you know, vocational instructors. But it's really not about that. It's not about compromising your sort of academic integrity or your academic mission. It's more about just acknowledging that, yes, 
students go to college to get jobs. That's a very big driver. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what you need to do, for example, is let's say you have, you have all kinds of core sciences like biology. Of course, in San Diego, it's a, it's a liberal arts topic. But San Diego has a thriving biotech industry. So mm. if the graduates mm. of Point Loma Nazarene go to work in biotech. It doesn't mean they're going to be lab scientists necessarily. They might be in marketing or sales or other things where all those liberal arts skills of communication and writing and so forth and synthesizing information, those will be really valuable. But you need to tell them that and you need to tell them how they can take the skills that they've learned in, in college and make a really good case for themselves uh, as they go out into the employment world. So this is this is not just completing your LinkedIn profile effectively. This is a, a, a really broad spectrum thing for a learner to do. But also we have a lot of there are a lot of steps that a college university can take, including partnering with some of these nonprofits. I, Absolutely. I, that was one of the pleasures of this book is learning about these groups with um, uh, uh, which are all very, very new. Uh, in, in the chat, uh, Charles Finley, thanks, uh, uh, shares a link to it. And uh, Nicholas Quick um, uh, says that uh, he, he, pr he praises your point about Kenyon. Uh, ben says that, you know, he can second uh, that that's what they're doing. Um, I, I have a, a second question Then I, I need to get out of the way because there's so many people who have comments and thoughts here. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate right now about the value of college. Um, is it worth going to a four-year institution? Is it worth going to a, getting your associate's degree? And so on. Uh, and you're, you come down very hard on the side of, yes, this is definitely worth it. Uh, an undergraduate degree will, you know, the odds are good that it's going to boost your lifetime earnings. Uh, it gives you all kinds of benefits. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, over the next three months, we may see this enter the presidential debates um, because of the, of the relatively high salience of academia here. Uh, can, you, can you briefly just lay out your case? Um, you know, what, what's, the, what's the value here of, of actually going to a college or university? Sure. Well, you know, maybe we'll come back to the presidential uh, uh, race because the, the, that does have some, some relevance to what's happening. You know, there is basically, in my view, there's a big paradox right now nationally. It's not just about the presidential race. It's been true for a number of years. There's huge worry in the, among the general public about college value. Um, we see this just recently in a Gallup poll that for the second year running found about a 36 percent rate of support for higher ed or belief in its value, which is down from 54 yeah. percent just five or six years ago. There's a lot of there's a big campaign to hire based on skills, not degrees. And that's not just something people are telling, you know, survey, you know, saying in surveys, they're actually there's less there's lower enrollment. But to me, the evidence is really clear that, you know, de degrees continue to have a lot of economic value compared to having just a high school diploma. The so-called college wage premium is real and also hiring for skills. Uh, we may talk about this in more detail, but it's kind of the flavor of the month in terms of something people talk about, but it's much more of a theory than a reality. It just simply is not happening yeah. any, to any great extent, despite all the hoopla that people are making about it. So yeah. Yeah. I just think that, you know, big picture, people worry about the value of degrees, I think, because they're worried about building a secure career over the long term in a changing economy. And so I think that to really get at the answers, and to, we have to get beyond a kind of one-dimensional view of, you know, college being the ivory tower and you know other kinds of short-term credentials being practical you know the reason i called my my book the career arts you know it's not the liberal arts although i love the liberal arts you know it's not the vocational arts although uh, you know, skills see. definitely have their place but it's the career arts because it's how can individuals put together the right mixture of ingredients to prosper professionally over the long term and that includes the broad skills that we associate with college degrees and it includes the targeted skills which you can Get in college. A lot of the majors are very popular, are pretty popular career focused majors like business and nursing and teaching, but you can also get them in other ways. And then, of course, you need that social capital, right? You need the third leg of the stool, which is building the networks so that you can find out about what jobs are available, but also so people that you've done a, a job for or an internship for or a professor you've worked with can vouch for you and they can say, yeah, this person is a good person to have on your team. So it's really that combination of factors. It mm -hmm. makes up the career arts, which I think is what people need to be thinking about in terms of what they have mm -hmm. to offer over their lifetime. Wow, that that makes thank you. Uh, that that makes sense. Uh, you, you you remind me a bit uh, of um, Brian Kaplan, is nearly a neighbor of mine, who's a guest on the program, who um, makes the case that the 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 signal most important benefit on the job market 
of going to college is the degree, the, the, the so-called sheepskin effect. And the argument goes that if, if you go to Harvard for 15 years and you take all these wonderful classes and you get great grades and everything, but you don't get a degree, you may as well have not gone. Um, that uh, they're having that BA, BS, MA, associate's degree, whatever it is, that's the key thing for the, for the labor market. Um, and, and that's a signal, a big signal. And, and you're saying that that signal is still live and well. Well, I mean, I think college value is authentic. So I'm a believer. I, Brian's, a, I've met him, I think, once. He's a very charming guy. Yes. I, I think that his, his, uh, his sort of his, his, his view expressed in his book is just not, is, 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 is just, is just not supported by, by a lot of evidence. I think that there is what's called the human capital theory, mm -hmm. why degrees mm -hmm. are valuable, which mm -hmm. is that you really learn something. That's what I think is true. I think that's what all of the most influential work. There's a wonderful book by Claudia Golden, who won the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and her husband, Larry Katz, called The Race Between Education and Technology. It's all about how the 20th century was the human capital century, because first high school diplomas became very valuable. We had the universal high school movement. Then we started seeing college diplomas get much more valuable. And, you know, if it was just about signaling, I certainly I would say most economists would say signaling is a component. And I think Brian Kaplan is right to the extent, you know, it's probably people might, you know, you could argue 20 percent, 25 percent, 30 percent of the value. But the idea that it's primarily about signaling, I think, just doesn't hold up because when you got into the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, you had way more people getting college degrees. And you might argue that, well, somehow that's going to dilute the value of college degrees as they become more plentiful. But in fact, just the opposite happened. We had way more people going to college. We had way more people completing college. And the degree, the wage premium kept on going up. So the idea that it was just about signaling, I think, is it doesn't make sense. And there's more I could say. I mean, I, I actually did an interview with this guy, Larry Katz, very prominent mm -hmm. labor economist at Harvard, um, who talks about some wonderful, he has a wonderful story about how when the high school movement um, you know, this goes back to the 1920s, the movement, the push to get more and more Americans going to high school was taking off. And he talked about how in, for example, a number of states that were heavily agricultural states, crop yields got much better as people got more education about the right mixture of chemicals and so forth. And he said to me, you know, I quoted him on this in the book, you know, it's not like the crops suddenly saw those high, those high school diplomas and they were really impressed with the piece of paper. <laughs> they learned something. They learned something that made them more effective farmers. And the same thing with the, the green revolution in, in places like India. Yeah. There's a lot of reason, and I could I could say more, I'll stop for now, but there's a lot of reason to believe that not that, that not that the signal is a non-issue, but this idea of it's kind of like a I think it's kind of frankly a kind of cheap debating point, like, oh, it's all the signal, those people would have done great anyway. There's all kinds of pretty good controlled experiments showing similar populations who did or didn't get the education. Um who did better when they got education. Do you think, uh, well, shoot. So thank you. Thank you for that, for that great answer. And I think I, I'd love to have you and Brian go at it. Um, and which would put you in a weird position of being outnumbered by Brian's, which doesn't happen that often. Um, <laughs> but, um, but friends, let, let me, let me get out of the way. The, the forum is about your questions and answers. You can tell Ben is a very generous, uh, thinker and, and speaker. Uh, and we already have questions that are just coming in. So again, if you're just joining us, uh, there are a few ways you can ask questions. The key way is on the bottom of the screen, along that white strip, you'll see a question mark. Uh, so just hit that button and type in your question. I'll display it on the screen like I'm about to do right now. Here's a question for one of our friends in Malta. Uh, so good evening, Philip. Uh, and he has a question. Ben mentions he has a portfolio career now. This is going to be common for everyone. So what should universities be doing to prepare students accordingly? And it feels like I'd love to talk about the uh, British higher education and, and polytechs later on. Um, but, but so this is a question. But put, yeah, I'll put it on the screen again. Uh, how, how can we support students for portfolio careers? Well, look, I mean, I don't know that I would hold myself up as a model for any any young students. Although, of course, I always like I love talking to, you know, young, young students who are people who are coming up and sort of figuring out the world. I mean, I suppose one one answer to that would be. You know, there's a lot of. I think it's almost. Uh, there was a there was a conference in Washington recently, Jobs for the Future, which I, I didn't attend, but I heard people a lot of talk about it. It's a very big conference, and there's a lot of talk about durable skills, which is one of those. Uh, you know, you could you could people used to talk about soft skills, durable skills, um, navigation skills are often discussed, but really, 
this comes back to what I think of as sort of the core, the broad academic skills that they, they you could associate them with the liberal arts or with other kinds of college education where you learn to write, to absorb information, to analyze information, to synthesize and to communicate to others. Those are incredibly important. So the, the question of, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a crystal ball about the economy. I don't know whether we're going to have a gig economy, you know, on a, on a widespread basis. I often joke when I tell people what I'm doing that it's kind of like the gig economy for grownups, you know, where you're doing mm -hmm. four or five different things. You know, I do a podcast, mm -hmm. book writing and some consulting. Mm -hmm. But I would say that the question is really good, though, in the sense that I think that, you know, people are living longer. My, my old colleague from Strata, Michelle Weiss, did a great book called Long Life Learning, mm -hmm. talking about how longer mm -hmm. life expectancies are going to translate into many more jobs and careers over a person's lifetime. And so I think that whether it's that kind of an economy or whether it's a portfolio where you're doing, you know, multiple jobs, I think that having the ability to go into a new situation, to assess it, to analyze it, and to figure out where you can add value is going to be really important. And those are all the those are all the things like that is not not to pick on coding. I have a lot of respect for people who are great, you know, computer scientists, but that isn't what coding boot camp is going to get you. Coding boot camp is going to get you one of those very targeted skills that might help you with the immediate needs. But as you know, somebody told me, another economist, David Deming, told me, you know, for the book, skills have a very sh those kinds of targeted skills have a short half life, meaning they may be great and they're what's needed immediately, but they may not be needed in two years. You know, when I was in college, you know, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, you know, I studied comparative literature. Um, that was my major, but I was doing lots of other topics. I did statistics and a little bit of calculus, and I took a computer programming class, just a really intro class. I learned how to program in basic yes. back in the 1980s, right? Yes. So I, I'm, I was proud that I learned to do like how to, how to, you know, how to play that old game Hangman or something in basic. Sure. But when I graduated, I'm sure nobody was using basic anymore. So this goes back to the, the portfolio career, which is it's, it's good to have some specific skills that are in demand right now for whoever your you know, boss or your client is, but it's also really important to have that ability to learn new things and to transition to new things and to figure out where you can add value there. Well, thank you. That's So first of all, thank you for that very, very rich answer and for giving me a chance to make a joke about basic in the chat, which I've already done. Um, and uh, I think you and I were studying the same thing uh, at the same time, just about. Uh, Philip, thank you for that excellent question. Um, I, I think. Ben has just laid out a really, really good strategy for quite a few people. The, the questions are flowing in, and I'm, I'm going to try and give everyone a chance to, uh, to ask. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Ursinus College, not too far from you, Ben, from uh, Professor Goldsmith. And she has a really interesting uh, psychological question. Anecdotally, I see a lot of shy students these days for whom building social capital isn't always easy. How do we get students who are more reticent to take advantage of these opportunities? I love the question, and I, gosh, I wish I had a good answer. I, so let's, let's put it this way. I have an answer, but it's not a bumper sticker answer. You know, I think that, I, it's funny, I, I spoke um, a few months ago at a, a high school in uh, called New Trier uh, High School, which is a very kind of academically intense high school in uh, north of Chicago. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, actually I was hearing from the counselors and the teachers was that the students are really looking for, like, what's the perfect you know, combination of activities and grades and classes mm -hmm. to get into one of these very selective colleges. And one of the things I tried to say, and this I think will relate to social capital, which is it's not like there's a specific box you have to check and like all of a sudden you're a, you're a person with a great network and it's all done. I think you have to view this as a iterative process, you know, where maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's going into a networking event or maybe it's learning about how to, you know, do a good LinkedIn profile or there's actually a nice piece by who, when I mentioned earlier, the founder of Braven, Ame mm -hmm. Yubik Davis, wrote a piece for Harvard Business Review, one of their online publications about how to do a really good LinkedIn profile. And it includes advice about if you're trying to approach somebody, like I don't know about you, but I've gotten, I get lots of connection requests that just come out of the blue. I don't know the person, they don't send a note. So that's kind of a little harder to, to assess. I, I'd, I'd like to be you know, friendly, but I don't, you know, I don't want to have 10,000 connections. And so yeah. telling, telling students, if you would like to connect with somebody, explain to them what you, why you'd like to, to, to be connected. Or if you'd like to have a, meet, have a meeting with them, explain to them. So there's some things you can do to give students those exact tools, even if they're shy. And you know, the law of averages hopefully means that over time, they'll try some different things. And 
the main thing is to view this as a period of you have a safety net if you're still in high school if you're in college mm -hmm. you know you don't have to have everything figured out right away and i think conveying that message is really important and then you know i think that social capital can be built through a lot of ordinary activities you know i i told the story of this when i spoke at this high school my one of my kids is i'm, I'm in his childhood bedroom right now it's my home office he was a big frisbee player in high school he was an ultimate frisbee player but the high school our local public high school you know great school but they didn't pay any attention to the sport they didn't give it any support they didn't give it any money the kids had to organize everything themselves they had to um plan the games they had to figure out who was going to do the transportation who was going to do the food mm -hmm. they, they in this particular sport there's no referee so you have to if you have a dispute over a call you have to work it out with the other the other player it's this kind of old-fashioned sort of ethos um all of that was incredibly good for social capital it wasn't like he took a class called how to build social capital he just did something he did a, a sport or a club and you have to just be aware it's like a lot of first gen students they feel like they're applying to college like well they had to work but yeah. they think of that as an afterthought but it's like no that's a strength mm -hmm. like you need to learn to if you work 20 or 25 hours a week at some very basic restaurant job or something that's something you can talk about because you learn you learn things in that job so i'll stop mm -hmm. there but there's a lot that you can tell people even if they're shy about how they can just try different things experiment and learn to take stock of their strengths without necessarily feeling like there's a perfect checklist they have to fill out well, well, thank you for that for that very passionate answer. And, and Professor Goldsmith, uh, thank you for the really good question. We had a, a kind of follow-up question came in the chat. Let me just quickly grab this. This is from uh, Joel Bloom. So that two of my kids have graduated college in the last few years are working on forging their career paths, but they refuse to use LinkedIn as a networking resource. They say it's for old people like Facebook. Are they right? <laughs> Well, I feel like, you know, I'm I'm uh, maybe I'm not the right person to ask because I, of course, I use LinkedIn a lot. I love LinkedIn, um, but I also don't want to pick sides, you know, because there is another there's another large company that is kind of pitching itself as a younger person's version of LinkedIn. And this is terrible. I'm suddenly blanking on the name. It's a large networking site that works a lot with college students. Um, uh, it's it actually I actually quote them in the book. I'm sorry. I'm having a, a middle age brain, brain freeze, but yeah. there there are. I mean, I guess there's two ways I would say there are there are different sites you can try, you know, but I also think LinkedIn doesn't have to be you don't have to use LinkedIn the way that your mom or dad does. You know, you may find I mean, it's just like there are people who use, you know, TikTok and do all kinds of videos and things. You can put videos on LinkedIn. You can get you can see what's going to get the most views. You know, you can write your you can write original posts. You can analyze, you know, the latest op eds that, that, that drew your interest or that you thought were completely wrong. You know, I think there's you can use it as a it's not quite what Twitter used to be as a debate, debating platform. But I think that one way to think about it is that you don't have to fit into the LinkedIn model of a different generation. You can create a different by the way, Handshake is the company. I'm sorry. It was taking me a second. No, so, yeah. company is called Handshake, you know, founded by some college students in the middle of the country in a very cold, snowy part of I think it was Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, they wanted to get networked and they didn't feel like they um, they knew the right people. And they, they, they feel like the fancy software firms that they were interested in didn't deign to come to their campus. So they had to figure out how to build their own network. And that's really much more geared very explicitly toward college students for recruiting and so on. Well, well thank you. And Joel, thank you for the question, which I, I just, you probably all see a white hair just bloomed on my, on my chin as a result from that. Uh, ben, the, thank, thank you for the answer. Um, Professor Goldsmith, I, I do wonder about the uh, the balance of of how comfortable your students are about being online and networking versus versus in person. But but we have we have more questions, and we have one from our dear friend uh, Tom Hames, who, as usual, um, asks one of those deep sounding questions. Uh, let's let's bring this one up here. How do we get past the industrial mindset that says things like if you build an accountant, she must go to the accounting department? Job success is far softer than subject knowledge. Well, I mean, you know, all I can say is, you know, I, I agree 100%. I mean, I think that it is, in a way, it's not that we have such a perfect system, but this basic system we have, you know, with the rise of general education, which I think really, you know, I think there was a lot of interest in, you know, figuring out what gen ed should look like in the 30s and 40s and 50s. You know, it's obviously not something where there's any kind of universal agreement. 
Most places are not. University of Chicago or Columbia with this very distinct core curriculum. Mm -hmm. But I do think we have a general ethos in American universities of having your major, which, as I mentioned before, is often contrary to this ivory tower stereotype. You know, the most popular majors are business, education, nursing, you know, computer science, of course, you know, things that have a lot of pretty clear practical um, import. But people also do, you know, some kind of, you know, usually some kind of writing, some kind of uh, social science, some kind of maybe they'll do some history or some art history, some foreign language. So I think that that um, I think trying to keep that going and to shore it up and to, to try and do as much as we can to tell students that, you know, life changes and, you, you know, you did not go to college. Your colleges do not position themselves as pure vocational training. Some aspect of that is important. But I think partly the message that it's really good, as I've been saying, is to communicate is that all of the things that you're doing, you know, whether it's learning to analyze literature or learning about history or doing all kinds of other topics, they may not be about your major and they may not be directly about a job, but those are all the things that are going to make you a well-equipped person in the job market. And I think that that's just the, that's this, this connection that people sometimes, they, they assume there is this very one-to-one -one connection between like a major and your whole career. And that just isn't how most people's careers work. That's true. That's very true. Um, you know, here's me as a literature uh, PhD, right? doing something very different. Um, Ben, we have a, a slew of questions coming in. I'm curious, would you be more interested right now in responding to questions that are about challenges to higher education or about changes within higher education? Oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> well, I will tell you, I'm seeing in the, in the chat, I'm not able to, unfortunately, I haven't kept up with it's all okay. of it. It's okay. It's okay. I'll see you before. A, a gentleman named Kyle um, Doomsh, if I'm saying yeah. that, who yeah. is very, thinks I've, I've really got it, gotten it badly wrong, and I've seen he's, he's commented in some other, uh, on social media too, so I wanted to, have the opportunity maybe to address that, which I think is really a direct. Let's let's do that right now. He, he actually shared a question. I, I want to put I'll put this up to give you something to to respond by. Then he keeps pushing the economic advantage of obtaining a degree, but degrees are unjustifiably expensive and time consuming, and are a deeply flawed assessment of job skills. So there's a very solid critique, three pronged. Have at it. Sure. I mean, look, I'm <laughs> I'm not going to be the one to say oh degrees you know the cost is is not a not a problem at all you know we have this very large and varied higher ed system in this country right so we all know about the places that are pushing a hundred thousand dollars a year with a sticker price we also know there are a lot a lot of local community colleges that are tend to be much more affordable and state universities but it's complicated because there's such variation by state by region and what the level of subsidies are what the financial aid packages are. I do know that there is some pretty compelling evidence that particularly for middle and lower income students, sticker price is really very different than the, the actual price that gets paid after financial aid. Again, right. I don't say that in any way to discount the concerns about, about rising tuition, the concerns about student debt, those are real. But I think, you know, the, the, basically there's various studies, you know, that you can look at. The question is really whether ROI is still on average positive for most college degrees. And I think the answer is yes. Now, we have a huge problem with non-completion, right? We have a lot of people who start and don't finish. Um, I think there's uh, that's probably the, in my view, that's probably the single biggest problem facing American higher ed. We have 40 million Americans or so, some yeah. college, no degree. Now, that also in a time of declining enrollment, that could be an opportunity for a lot of colleges to do a better job serving adult learners, serving people who wanna come back, did not have a good experience in higher ed. So I guess I would say, to go back to the, the question, you know, yes, th there's no question that there's also been a change in sort of expectations over historically, the idea of college is more of a public good to college is something which has this demonstrated financial return. Therefore, maybe it's a kind of a combination of a public good and a private good where it is reasonable to spend something on college or to borrow some money on college. And then, then the questions become that what, you know, how much is too much? How much borrowing is too much? How much spending is too much? So that's not a crisp answer, but I guess I would just point to the research, you know, and also to people, you know, for a long time kind of voting with their feet, you know, where people, you know, more and more people were going to college. And, you know, although the returns have leveled off in the last 15 or 20 years, there's still a very high differential between going to college and just having a high school diploma. And then the last thing I, the last thing I would say is, 
there's some very interesting research looking at very similar people who were in college, but maybe they, there's one study that looks where they, they implemented a certain grade point average cutoff. So very similar students were looked at who were either just above the cutoff and were able to stay in college and who were just below the cutoff and did not. And the ones who got the credential did much better financially in terms of future income. So that's one way of trying to get at this argument that the only reason there's a better financial return from college is it's not because of what they learn, it's because of this, um, you know, essentially the selection effect. And there's some pretty good research that suggests there really is something about the education that's making a difference. Uh, I just have to inter uh, mention something unrelated for a second. Uh, ben, is the weather okay by you right now? Oh, um, cloudy, but but nothing nothing actively bad going on. Okay, sorry for everyone. Just uh, both Ben and I, are, our homes are in the path of Hurricane Debbie. Um, and so it, it just wanted to, as, as a shout out in case we have any glitches as a result of power going out or anything. So far, it looks pretty benign. The biggest problem is going to be uh, maybe uh, four, nine inches of water. But just, just as a quick heads up, sorry, I should have mentioned that earlier today. Um, ben, it, to back to your, to your, to your thoughtful, uh, detailed answer to uh, Gil's thoughtful, detailed question. Um, we do have a, I mean, you, you point out the majority of degrees generate return. Um, but that is not 100% uh, of the degree experience. And, and I'm curious, what, can, uh, what do we do that in higher education we have certain institutions, which are especially good at producing students who don't get a return? Um, you know, what do we do about the pathways through generally good institutions where students emerge and do not make back their debt and are stuck with debt for life? Um, we don't have uh, a federal oversight on I mean, the, the most we have is the college scorecard from the Obama administration. Uh, state governments uh, aren't really active in this. Um, and most accrediting agencies, this is not a large priority. Uh, and for professional associations within higher education, this is not usually on the radar at all. Um, what, what can we do within the whole higher education ecosystem? What can we do to try to reduce those bad pathways and honestly, bad programs and some bad institutions. Boy, I wish I had a magic wand. You know, there isn't a there isn't a sort of quick, you know, I don't have a master plan for how we could fix everything all at once. You know, I think that I think there are certain principles that we should bear in mind. You know, the first one is, you know, as I say in my, you know, my, my conclusions, right, I think going to college is generally a really good decision if you complete college. So one of the first things we need to do before we get into, I mean, of course, there's lots of details about differential returns by major and so forth. And that's tricky, you know, because to, to try to answer that part of the question, you know, I'm not going to tell people, I don't know that, you know, it depends, all depends on your circumstances, but I don't think telling somebody, oh, you must not study sociology or you must not study art history because those don't mm -hmm. tend to get, you know, high starting salaries. You know, I do think that knowledge is power. And it's, it's an old fashioned idea that we should have. That's why the college scorecard, well, it's, it's highly imperfect, but I think it's, a, it's part of a useful trend towards saying people should should be well informed. They should know what the chances are. They should know, first of all, the, all the returns that you know we talk about, the 75% wage premium for college graduates is an average. There's some that are much higher. There's some that are lower. Yeah. And it also is, is contingent on completion, right? There's some, there's some other analyses that are done looking at college returns which come up with much worse returns because they include in the denominator, when you're doing the calculation, all those who started it and didn't finish. I'm not sure that's a that's a sound methodological decision because you know I personally think one of the one of the great strengths of the the, U, the United States is that we're a land of second and third and fourth chances. Mm -hmm. The idea that you should err on the side of keeping as, the doors open as much as possible, knowing that not everyone's going to make it. But I also think we could do much better trying to get people to complete. But just to quickly go back to where you started, you know, I think that you you got to give people information about the different kinds of you know financial returns to different majors but also the time horizon is really important because for example i mentioned david deming earlier the harvard economist he's at the kennedy school mm -hmm. um, you know he uh he wrote a piece in the new york times maybe six or eight years ago about liberal arts uh graduates he'd done some research showing that yes they start off behind in terms of average wages but they actually, by middle age, they're actually doing much, they're, 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 if not completely caught up, they're much closer to the STEM graduates. Yeah. Partly has to do with the different skill sets as you 
get beyond mm -hmm. those entry level jobs. You're getting into management jobs, mm -hmm. leadership roles. Some of, of course, liberal arts colleges will grads will go to law school or sometimes medical school. So there's lots of things that can happen over time. So there's just various factors that you have to consider. And it doesn't mean you should be complacent. You know, there are a lot of colleges that don't do uh, as good a job as they should with persistence and with retention. I think there's more awareness of that than there used to be. But and I think, you know, frankly, it, it, it may become, you know, it may become a necessity because of the financial problems colleges are facing and the enrollment problems they're facing. It's really going to be in their self-interest uh, beyond their pure educational mission to try and keep people enrolled by making sure that they don't they don't uh, drop out. Now, that is an excellent bridge to our next question. And and thank you. Thank you for that answer. And and Kiel, as always, thank you for your persistent critique. Um, you know, I really value this. And I really value the exchange uh, that both of you just had right now. But you, you're, you're talking about institutions changing. And uh, I want to bring up a really, really great question from uh, our friend James Shulman, uh, you know, in many ways, author, previous guest in the program, founding director of Art Store, and now at the ACLS. And he has a question about one particular key population on campus. Is the tide turning on faculty willingness to help students understand how their class translates into career skills? Or, and do you have any good strategies for helping faculty feel good about doing this bridging work? Well, hi, James. It's, I'm, glad, I'm so glad you're on, you're on today. And uh, I really appreciate the question. You know, I think I mentioned one specific example from the book earlier, which is the Point Loma Nazarene, this idea of putting career services in the provost's office. That's, that's, just, that's just one example of a small liberal arts school. But I think in general, in so much of higher ed, you know, they're culture change is hard. You know, I think about a place like another example in the book is at Wellesley College. There's a mm -hmm. neuroscience professor mm -hmm. who has a senior capstone seminar where one of the things she does in that class is she just brings in practitioners who are neuroscientists to come and talk to the, the women um, who are seniors by that time about what their careers are like. And again, to me, I, it almost feels like intuitively that doesn't feel like that's compromising of the, the liberal arts mission of this kind of venerable women's liberal arts college. It's it's a normal thing for people to be curious about what their studies might lead to, um, you know, but <laughs> there's all the, all the old lines about turning around the battleship is hard. You know, I think maybe maybe the, the answer, part of the answer has to be for faculty to say, you know, if you want to be part of a thriving higher education ecosystem, you don't have to be a job coach in a direct sense or a job trainer, but if you can really make the case, you know, not just in an abstract sense, but with examples, with with bringing people in to speak, by maybe bring your former students in and showing people how the fact that they, you know, became really good, you know, they were they were good at writing essays, helped make them, you know, really good in marketing or something. There's all kinds of things you could try to do to show that these kind of core academic skills really do hold you in good stead when you get into the job market. And I think. That's just a long-term challenge with faculty. But, uh, but I mean, the, yes, yes, and th this is terrific. And, and the Wellesley example is a great one. But I, I'm, I'm caught by the second question, second part of James's question, which is how to make faculty feel good about this. And I, I, I run into this myself. I mean, I, I teach in a master's degree program, so it's it's not really an issue. I, we're, we're very career oriented, and that's fine. Um, but I, I do run into this when I when I talk with uh, faculty about about jobs and careers, inevitably. And usually from the humanities, someone will say, well, that's not all that higher education is about. I, I know in your book, you quickly set that aside. You say, short book, we're focusing on one thing, we're not going to talk about that. But but how do you how do you keep faculty from stopping other faculty from doing this? How, how, how do you make this acceptable for faculty to do? Look, I mean, the, 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 the question of what's professionally rewarded, you know, in the sort of professoriate is really tough. You know, I just happened to run into a a family friend yesterday, who's uh, who's in a graduate pro a PhD program. Um, I think he's a, he's at a, a big a big state university in the South, and he loves teaching. Um, but even at a, this this is not a you know it's a good university, but it's not a super elite university. But the fact is the the reward and the incentive structure is really all about writing and publishing and research. And I actually am I'm kind of hoping that'll help that'll be good for him when he ends up you know, trying to go for some teaching jobs where he can authentically say that he wants to teach. But I don't know that I have a good answer to that. I mean, I think that if there are faculty who sort of turn their noses up at 
you know, helping yeah. students in some concrete sense get jobs. It just seems to me that's 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 wrongheaded. And yeah, you're not going to get the professional societies to adopt new guidelines probably very easily. But I think, you know, again, the, the idea that if you believe that building public support is important for the future of higher education, then I think you can, there is a way in which you can talk about it. even things like there's so much interest now in getting better, you know, better internships and jobs and faculty are such a valued and trusted resource for that, that if they can view that as a selling point, as one of the things that they provide to their students being translators between the classroom and the sort of the, the, the and workforce, I think that's going to make them just get more public support. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good answer, James. That's a really, really great question. And I'm, I hope we're figuring this out. And I hope I hope the tide has turned for this. Now, speaking of tides turning, we have uh, another question. And this was asked by two different people. So I'm going to flash on the screen in, in a row. Uh, the first comes up with our good friend, Peter Shea, up in uh, New England. Uh, and he asks uh, quite, uh, quite clearly and directly, how do you see artificial intelligence impacting career education in higher education? And then immediately, like within seconds, um, uh, from uh, Middlesex Community College, Irina Case asked a version of the same question. So I put her up here as well. Can you please discuss how AR tools are being used to enhance the impact of career services? What are the most impactful applications and tools you've seen in this area? So we have AI has now entered the chat. Uh, okay, okay. Well, I'm going to probably tackle the first one. I don't feel that I have the kind of granular knowledge of AI to be able to give a good answer to the second one. But I think that, you know, it's, it's funny, and obviously no no discussion of any kind is complete in 2024 without how is, how is AI going to affect it. Once again, I, 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 don't, I don't have any uh, crystal ball answers to this, but I think I would go back to the, the point I made about um, you know about about coding coding boot camp which used to be viewed some people viewed that as you know a great alternative you know better, yeah. better return on investment you know you don't have to go through all the sort of fluffy irrelevant classes you don't don't have to deal with the campus culture wars and all that stuff you just learn something that's needed in the economy well guess what you know as i understand it um gen ai is pretty good at a lot of basic coding tasks um, not necessarily the more the more elegant, sophisticated sort of software architecture that you really do need a, you know a, a human in the loop for that. I think that's the expression they use. But yeah. there are there if you were convinced that like this very practical, hands-on kind of coding experience was going to uh, be your salvation in the economy, that would have been a mistake. And I think that all those traditional broad education skills that we talk about are still going to be needed. I recently, I do a podcast, Higher Ed Spotlight, and I recently interviewed Ethan Mollick, who is mm -hmm. um, who is the author of this new best-selling book about, about artificial intelligence. He's a professor at the Warden School at Pennsylvania, I think, at, at University of Pennsylvania. It's called, um, oh, I have it on my shelf here. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, well. called, it's called co-intelligence. But so that actually does relate to the question because co-intelligence is he has this really nice image of, thinking about large language models, LLMs, Gen AI, as a very, very hardworking sous chef that doesn't know anything. And the idea is it'll do whatever you tell it. It won't get tired. It'll work all night. But it needs to have a, a guiding human partner telling it what to do. And so I think part of the part of the argument you know, for the, the kind of education that we've talked about and these kinds of broad skills, those are the things that will equip you to continue to be the, the person in charge of the Gen AI and not to have your, I mean, yes, yeah, some jobs may be eliminated, but we'll have different kinds of jobs. But I think your best bet is always going to have, be to have that, that, that broad background, those broad skills, and to be able to, you know, make the changes and to adapt as you need to in this different kind of era. That, that sounds like a, a good start, uh, a good way of grappling with this. And, uh, I'm glad that you brought in uh, Malik on this, um, and I'm. I, th I think this is a this is this is one of the really deep ones right now. I I, uh, I I've seen quite a few AI applications across higher education, uh, but uh, uh, Irina, I haven't seen uh, one particularly aimed at uh, career education not yet. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see one appear, say, in the next four hours. Um, uh, in the, the the chat has been on fire. Uh, there's been all kinds of stuff and uh, 
friends, do you mind if uh, if I share the chat with uh, with Ben afterwards? Just let me know in the chat if you if you've been active there. Uh, I'm worried that we're approaching the end of the hour, and uh, we have a great question that might cap things off. Uh, so let me just. Uh, this is a question from our friend on the West Coast, uh, Sally Mudiamu, uh, and she asks this, which you know really looks ahead a bit and goes also to uh, to Wise's book. Uh, what do you think of the lifelong learning model from Michael Crow in lieu of a degree? So what do you think about that without getting the degree? I, you know, I, I'm actually curious whether, look, Michael is just terrific. He's a, sort of a force of nature. He's also been one of my podcast guests. I don't know whether he whether he himself advocates the, the idea of lifelong learning and substituting for degrees. Like, I don't know if he wants to put himself out of business at, at ASU or if he's, or if that's the question that comes from the the, from the, the question, the questioner, um, but I'll try to I'll try to answer. I'm just not not being entirely certain of what he's what he's proposed. You know, look, I don't think there's something sacred about degrees. I, but I think that we just know that there is the reality that, of course, degrees are not perfect, but that they have proven, you know, and again, just looking at it purely in economic terms, to have considerable value on average for those who go to college and get those degrees. And I would, I would argue it's because they've gotten that, the things I've talked about, these three things, this bundle of broad skills, plus some targeted skills, plus social capital. And those are things that don't always, but often will come together in a, a degree program if you're able to get through. Um, lifelong learning, you know, who could be against it? I mean, I think you can become, be a lifelong learner with or without a degree. Um, I think the whether or not it would substitute for it, I think is in a way you could say that's an empirical question. I mean, the question yeah. would be whether, you know, there's always been, obviously there's a, there's a big tradition of autodidacts and people who have made their way through um, life, you know, and of course there was a lot of talk about this with the advent of the internet. Oh, well, who's going to, who's going to have to go to college anymore? You can just get it all online. Well, that hasn't really happened uh, so far. And I think that's partly because we, we know that the power of curation is really important. And, I still, I guess I have this old fashioned belief in the power of teaching. Um, I think that being self-taught is a, is a very respectable and it can be a wonderful thing, but I still believe that there are a lot of wise people out there who can teach you know, each new generation a lot of things that'll be useful to them. So I'm absolutely in favor of lifelong learning, but it's just hard. I feel like it's not possible for me to say whether or not in 50 years that's going to be a viable substitute for this proven package of things that we've that we've called degrees. Well, first of all, Sally, good to hear from you. And another really good question. Uh, and Ben, but thank you. Thank you for running at that question. It's a, it's a fascinating idea. Um, kind of counterintuitive based on where we began with our hour discussion. I, I do have one last question and we've only got two minutes left. So this is gonna have to be fast. Um, uh, what happens if we take a, a let's say a, a typical mid-tier college or university and, uh, and they take your message to heart? And they decide to redesign as much of their institution as possible, drawing on outside resources and agencies like you know Handshake, et cetera, to try and you know, try and really improve this. Um, you know the the tide turns for them. James Shulman's uh, phrasing so that the faculty are actually keen on this. Um, what what does this look like in in ten years? How, or I should say, how is this different from other institutions? Well, look, I'm always in favor of anybody who takes the position. We're not just going to rest on our laurels. And maybe it's through necessity. You know, there's enrollment pressures, there's financial pressures. Maybe it's just out of the goodness of their hearts, but they feel like we can have our cake and eat it too. We can deliver a great education and provide these broad and targeted skills, and we can get our students ready for the, the real world jobs they're facing. I think that's a great marketing. I mean, it's a great substantive plan. And I think it's, I think that I would hope that that would lead to you know, higher enrollment and a more financially healthy institution. So, you know, in an ideal world, that becomes kind of a test case where other colleges yeah. want to follow you. And maybe it becomes a market differentiator. Um, you know, this is uh, this is one that has that career, which takes us precisely to uh, three o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And I, I'm afraid, Ben, I think we, we could we could talk for hours. Uh, <laughs> you you have so much energy, so much knowledge on this score, and you you've thought so deeply about this. Thank you, thank you very, very much uh, for for 
this, this hour of rich conversation. And I'm also glad that both of us have stayed dry and our electrical powers <laughs> remain done. What's what's the best way to keep up with you? Should uh, should we follow the old people that uh, Joel Bloom mentioned and follow you on LinkedIn, or is there a, another yeah, way? To keep up with I'm you? afraid so. I'm probably dating myself. But first of all, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for all the questions. I know we only got to a fraction of them, but I really appreciate it, and I appreciate the pushback. I appreciate this is what keeps me, you know, trying to be as as I hope as as thoughtful and sharp as I can. Um, I'm on LinkedIn pretty regularly. I try to keep it up to date with podcasts and articles and, you know, videos and things like that. Um, I do Twitter X, you know, whatever, because I couldn't find a better alternative. I'm not happy with what's happened to that place. Um, those are really the two best places to find me. Well, that works for us. Um, and, you know, if we're going to keep talking about LinkedIn in a positive light, we're going to really get some support from them, some kind of sponsorship. Um, uh, ben, Thank you so much. Please uh, continue the great work. Good luck with the uh, world of uh, SQL. I'm really looking forward to that global dance mix version. And uh, good, luck with, good luck with Harvard. I think you have a lot to show them. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, thank you, friends. Uh, but don't go away yet. I need to uh, just uh, let you know where we're headed next. Uh, but thank you all for the string of fantastic questions and a great discussion. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, about everything from the value of college to how best to structure career services to the impact of AI, just find us up on, on all the socials. Uh, you can find me there on Twitter or on LinkedIn, uh, Mastodon, Threads, uh, Blue Sky, just use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions uh, where we've covered this subject, take a look at tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. If you want to look at our sessions coming up, we have a whole bunch of uh, tackling every aspect of higher education. Just go to the forum website at forum.futureofeducation.us. And for the rest of you, we're barreling through August right now like a hurricane across the American Southeast. I hope you're all safe and sound, most seriously. I hope you're preparing for fall semester uh, very well. It's a pleasure, as always, thinking and talking with you. I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.